1963, the murder conviction of John Brady was overturned by the United States Supreme Court, which ruled that prosecutors had not disclosed all known facts pertinent to the case, specifically that Brady didn't commit murder. Prosecutors, eager to get yet another conviction, had decided not to share with Brady and his lawyers a letter written by another man who took sole responsibility for the act. Since then, the Brady Rule has required prosecutors to pass along material related to guilt or to punishment, known as exculpatory evidence, to defendants before a plea is entered. Failure to do so is said to be a violation of due process. Less than a decade later, another case, Giglio v. U.S., strengthened the Brady Rule by mandating that defendants and their lawyers had to be told about information that cast doubt on the credibility of government witnesses involved in the case. Police employees, being political actors who have questionable integrity, are supposed to be kept on a Brady list. Qualifications for inclusion include lying under oath, what's known as testa lying, or other misdeeds done when in an official capacity, which in plain English means that when a person has on a police costume. So where are those Brady lists? They're certainly not readily available on the website of your local cop shop or district attorney's office. The simple truth is that there is no set process on how this information is to be shared, thus the norm is censorship on behalf of those who keep those lists. And even though prosecutors are tasked with informing the defendant that a police employee set to testify is indeed included on the Brady list, that doesn't always happen. It's ultimately contingent on the decision reached by a handful of senior prosecutors. Regardless of the lip service given to justice and to transparency, the injustice system and its actors rest firmly on double standards and censorship. As said Mary Ellen Rumond, a Washington-based lawyer, although the case is 50 years old, how prosecutors and police are complying with Brady in regard to dishonesty and police officers is in its infancy. In L.A., the process to comply with the Brady list was created only after a massive police scandal. Dozens and dozens of police employees active with the Rampart Crash Unit, planting evidence, testa lying, dealing drugs, beatings and shootings, and bank robbery, which cost area taxpayers 125 million Federal Reserve notes for settlements. Within five years, that Brady list process had been adopted by a handful of other police outfits in Southern California. In San Diego, Jeff McDonald of the San Diego Union Tribune solicited the Brady list from the local attorney. Since the DA claims to be dedicated to the pursuit of truth and justice and to strive for open and forthright communication, one would think that the request would be quickly granted, right? Wrong. The response received said that any information that may lead to the identification of the officers is confidential. As opined Margaret Dooley Samuli from the San Diego ACLU, if officers are unreliable in court, are they reliable in our communities? This default to protect the identities of police employees who have questionable integrity is not surprising. After all, we're talking about an institution that does not have to respond to market signals. All police employees and their outfits rely on a claimed legitimate right to extort you to then protect you. And prosecutors, who are supposed to maintain the Brady lists, tend to rely on donations and support from police unions to get elected. Many, therefore, are hesitant to rock the boat and call into question hundreds or thousands of convictions that relied on testimony given from someone known to lie. Such is the norm when justice is said to be provided by a course of monopoly. That institution and its actors are inherently unaccountable. Yet Richard Bradley, the president of the Boston Police Patrolmen's Association, had the audacity to claim that in 27 years on the Boston force, he never encountered the practice of testifying. Sure, honesty among police employees in legal land is not absolute. Anyone truthful, including some police employees, readily acknowledges that fact. Joseph D. McNamara, when head of the San Jose police outfit, stated, As someone who spent 35 years wearing a police uniform, I've come to believe that hundreds of thousands of law enforcement officers commit felony perjury every year testifying about drug arrests. In fact, during the legal land venture, Ademo Freeman and I had a few years ago in Greenfield, Mass., it was a lie told by a police employee on the stand that one juror cited as the reason he determined that Ademo and I were not guilty. That police employee, Todd M. Dodge, had been asked by Ademo if he'd ever broken the law. Dodge replied no. There exists thousands of pages of legalese conflated to be law, much of which is contradictory. The average person violates a handful of felonies each day, and Dodge claims he's never broken a law? Dodge should be included on the Brady list, and maybe he already is, 
but good luck finding out that information. As Richard Lisko, a Baltimore police employee noted in Police Chief Magazine, even though the Brady decision is nearly 50 years old, law enforcement agencies across the country are reluctant, if not defiant, to disclose potentially damaging information about police officers within their ranks. Earlier this week, I called the Attorney General's Office for Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New York. For the most part, that communication was fruitless. Despite the passage of almost a week, I've yet to hear back from anybody about how the Brady lists could be obtained. Even the one time I was told that I could file a FOIA request, that was quickly followed up with a statement that that FOIA request would likely not be fulfilled. Had others experienced more success, I scoured the web and found only a handful of examples when Brady lists that were sought were provided. In Florida, the Brady list was provided to the staff of the Sun Sentinel earlier this year, which listed police employees convicted of crimes, those under criminal investigation, and those being investigated for discharging their firearms. In 2010, the writers of the Phoenix New Times obtained the Brady list for Maricopa County, which listed hundreds of police employees, including Jeffrey Hines, then the head of the Phoenix Police Outfit's Internal Affairs Department, who now teaches about police management at nearby Arizona State University. In the Shire, where I now reside, the Brady List is referred to as the Lori List. In 2013, Elizabeth Dynan of the Portsmouth Herald and Seacoast Media Group filed a right to know requests, New Hampshire's version of the FOIA, with each county's head prosecutor to obtain the Lori List. Though much of the information received was redacted, it was learned that more than 60 police employees were included, said Dynan. The process tracking them is so secretive it is virtually impossible to identify them or even say for sure exactly how many there are. Thanks to a submission made to Coplock, the identities of a few of those police employees are known. Matthew Juega, Michael Buckley, and Jonathan Dushney, who all partook in the unjust beating of Chris Meklovich, a name that may be familiar to you if you're aware of the Chalking 8 incident. That trio recently attempted to get their names removed from the Lori list, but their request was denied. So, with the lack of rigor surrounding Brady lists, and the less than willing disposition of prosecutors to share them, why was it thought worthwhile to address this topic? Because it acts as yet another data point to underscore the failure of a centralized coercive monopoly to provide safety or accountability or any such idealistic goal. If a police employee is known to be of such questionable character, shouldn't that information be made public? Would you choose to hire known liars and predators to protect you? Consider Anthony Aravelos, who, despite being named in a dozen lawsuits that cost area taxpayers millions of Federal Reserve notes, was still employed as a San Diego police employee when he sexually molested a woman in the bathroom of a 7-Eleven. And just a couple hours to the north, Vince Mater, who worked for the Fullerton Police, the same outfit where the killers of Kelly Thomas were employed, whose inclusion on the Brady list wasn't made public until he was quietly dismissed after he destroyed crucial evidence, his department issued audio recorder and the chip that had captured his exchanges with Dean Gochiner, who was shortly afterwards said to have committed suicide in his cage. Would you choose to hire such a person of disrepute? That's what this conversation is ultimately about. Choice. Today, with the failed injustice system, there is no choice, there is no accountability, and there never will be, as that institution is based on a double standard that some people have the right to extort others. It's been over 50 years since the Brady List was kicked off. It's failed to curtail the very real and very negative actions done by dishonest police employees. If you know of a dishonest police employee, let others know. And that includes you too, current police employees. Your silence is acceptance. To bring about real change, shed any vestiges of legitimacy you yourself grant to that corrupt institution and to the bankrupt idea that positions some as rulers and others as ruled.